This is the second introductory presentation on waste stabilisation ponds. Ponds are shallow, generally rectangular lakes, arranged in a series of anaerobic, facultative and maturation ponds. Anaerobic and facultative ponds are mainly for BOD removal, and excreted pathogen removal occurs mainly in facultative and maturation ponds, although some BOD removal occurs in maturation ponds, and some pathogen removal in anaerobic ponds. Algae occur in facultative and maturation ponds, but hardly ever in anaerobic ponds. There are a few other types of ponds, such as macrophyte ponds and high-rate algal ponds, but these can't be recommended for general use. There are also polishing ponds, and these are essentially maturation ponds used to improve the quality, and commonly the microbiological quality, of the effluent from a conventional electromechanical wastewater treatment plant. The hydraulic retention time in a pond system is anywhere between, very typically anyway, 5 and 50 days. This is much longer than in conventional works, where the retention time is generally well under a day. Ponds have many advantages. They are usually the cheapest, both to construct and to operate and maintain. They can achieve very high removals of excreted pathogens, for example up to a sixth log unit reduction of excreted bacteria. That's a removal of 99.9999%, with each of these nines being a significant figure. Up to a four log unit reduction of excreted viruses, and 100% removal of helminth eggs, and generally over 90% removal of protozoan cysts and oocysts. Ponds are very simple to operate and maintain, and only unskilled but supervised labour is needed for this. Because of their large size, they have a very good resistance to shock loads, both hydraulic and organic, and they have excellent resistance to heavy metals, up to at least a mixed heavy metal content of 30 milligrams per litre. We're now going to look at a case study developed by Jim Arthur for the World Bank in the early 1980s. He compared four different wastewater treatment processes to treat the wastewater from the city of Sana'a in the Yemen Arab Republic. Arthur designed these systems for a population of 250,000, a wastewater flow of 120 litres per person per day, and a BOD contribution of 40 grams per person per day. The final effluent was to have no more than 25 milligrams per litre BOD and below 10,000 faecal coliforms per 100 mil. Initially, Arthur used a discount rate, or opportunity cost of capital, of 12%, and a land price of 5 US dollars per square metre. Actually, if we were doing these calculations now, rather than as Arthur did in the 1980s, we'd most likely use a final faecal coliform count of 1,000 per 100 mil, and not 10,000 per 100 mil. Arthur designed his four systems to produce effluents which were closely similar. So the aerated lagoon system was designed with maturation ponds, and the oxidation ditch and biofilters were followed by effluent chlorination in order to get the faecal coliform count the same as that produced by ponds, that is, to below 10,000 per 100 mil. What Arthur did next was to compare the cost of the four systems in net present value or net present worth terms. Ponds were the cheapest and NPV of just over 5 million US dollars. The next cheapest was the oxidation ditch at just under $6 million and the other two were more expensive. The figures in the table are for a discount rate of 12% and a land price of $5 per square metre. He then allowed the discount rate to vary while keeping the land price constant at $5 per square metre. His figure, reproduced in this slide, shows that ponds were cheapest up to a discount rate of somewhere between 15 and 16%. For higher rates, the oxidation ditch was cheapest. He then repeated this for land prices up to $15 per square metre. And his results are plotted in this figure. The y-axis is the land price below which ponds were the cheapest option, and the x-axis is the discount rate. You can see that there's almost a linear relationship between these two parameters. This shows the range of land prices between $5 and $15 per square metre, below which, depending on the discount rates, ponds were the cheapest option. The next cheapest option was always oxidation ditches. Now $5 to $15 per square metre is $50,000 to $150,000 per hectare, which are very high land prices, much higher than the best quality agricultural land in England, for example. So land costs are unlikely to militate against ponds, provided, of course, that we honestly compare the costs of different treatment systems, as Arthur did. This slide shows Arthur's results as before, but with one very important difference. In the column on the right, we have included the resale or salvage value of the land 
at the end of the project life. And this is really where ponds score highly. Their NPV is now very much less than those of the other three systems. So land bought for ponds is an investment, and a really good example of this has been reported for the city of Concord in California. The city bought land for ponds in 1955 for $50,000 per hectare, and by 1975, 20 years later, it was worth $370,000 per hectare. Inflation in the US during this period was more or less exactly 100%, so $50,000 in 1955 was equal to $100,000 in 1975, and thus the profit in real terms was $370,000 minus $100,000, or $270,000 per hectare. And of course it's very easy to convert the land from ponds to some other use, an industrial estate for example. In developing countries, conventional wastewater treatment processes, such as activated sludge, have several major disadvantages. The first is cost, and we can say that their costs are always very high, with a high requirement for foreign exchange. Secondly, to operate and maintain them properly requires skilled labour, labour that would be better employed in local manufacturing industries, for example. And thirdly, they only achieve a 90-99% to removal of excreted pathogens. A 90-99% to removal of BOD would be excellent, but for faecal coliforms, for example, it's actually rather poor. Why? Because raw wastewater contains between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 faecal coliforms per 100 ml, so a removal of 90-99% to means that the final effluent would contain somewhere between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 7 faecal coliforms per 100 ml. So really, a 90-99% to removal of excreted bacteria is pretty close to zero. This slide shows an oxidation ditch serving a small town near Hanoi in Vietnam. The oxygen required for BOD removal is supplied by four rotors, but the installed power was only two kilowatts, and to make matters worse, the power is not normally switched on. This is actually quite common as the local authority can't afford to pay the electricity bill. So we have to ask the question, was an oxidation ditch the best choice in this case? And the answer is a resounding no. When we are comparing natural wastewater treatment, in ponds for example, with conventional electromechanical treatment such as activated sludge, the choice really boils down to a choice between land and electricity. And we have to remember that money spent on land is an investment, but the money you spend on electricity is money gone forever. You just don't see it again.